I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today. All while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners! Elise here to remind you of all the ways you can support the podcast and the work that Courtney and I do. First up, we have a Patreon. Our Patreon patrons receive exclusive bonus content. Every month we do a roundup of Shakespeare-related content we have found online. We also share Patreon-exclusive bonus episodes of the podcast. These look like extended versions of episodes you've heard here, collaborations with other Shakespeare podcasters, and Courtney and I doing reviews of Shakespeare-adjacent media, like TV shows, movies, and books that are inspired by or loosely based on Shakespeare and Shakespeare plays. Patreon patrons also receive snail mail from the podcast, and some levels even vote on future episodes of our podcast. If you are interested in checking out our Patreon or just the Shakespeare-related names we've given the tiers of support, head to patreon.com slash Shakespeare anyone. The link is also in our episode description. After you've done that, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertising. Thank you so much for all of the support you give the podcast. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to another Shakespeare Anyone mini-episode. In these mini-episodes, we'll be exploring topics that are related to Shakespeare, but aren't necessarily connected to whatever play we've been discussing. And they're mini because, well, they're shorter than our other episodes. They're like quartos if the regular episodes are folio editions. In today's episode, we'll be talking about Ovid's Metamorphoses and Shakespeare. Unless you're living under a rock, you know the name William Shakespeare. And that name, Shakespeare, is synonymous with art and culture in Western society. While we at Shakespeare Anyone want to discuss Shakespeare without the bardolatry, it is vital to acknowledge his influence on, well, everything. For better or worse, Shakespeare shows up everywhere you look. But Shakespeare didn't emerge out of a vacuum as some genius. He was a practicing playwright and theater maker who was inspired by the world around him. We've already talked about some of those influences. For example, we can see texts like Holinshed's Chronicles, events like the Gunpowder Plot, and pamphlets about court gossip possibly influencing his plays. But, according to scholars like Shakespeare's Globe's head of research, Dr. Will Tosh, and former guest on the pod, Sir Jonathan Bate, Ovid's Metamorphoses is likely Shakespeare's favorite book. Now, this is a large claim to be made. We don't actually know what books Shakespeare loved because we don't have a Shakespeare book talk video or Substack article telling us his favorite reads of the month. All bad jokes aside, we don't even have writings from Shakespeare's diary or pamphlets to learn about his opinions on anything. In which case, scholars extrapolate from a wide variety of information ranging from the play's texts, narrative sources, themes, and verbal echoes to come to a conclusion about Shakespeare's influences. Through this work, it's easy to see how Ovid's collection of myths was a powerful source of inspiration for the Bard's plays and poetry. And whether or not Shakespeare was actually an avid Ovid fanboy, Ovid is the only classical author to be name-dropped in Shakespeare's plays. And, of the small number of specific books Shakespeare's characters read on stage, Ovid's Metamorphosis is featured twice. But before we talk about Ovid's influence on Shakespeare, who was Ovid? 
Publius Ovidius Naso, known as Ovid, was a Roman poet born in 43 BCE, one year after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Ovid's family was well-to-do and sent him and his brother to Rome to be educated. Even though Ovid was a member of the knightly class, which was likely to lead him to a career in politics, he left politics to write poetry. Ovid's most popular work is the 15-book compendium of mythological stories called Metamorphoses. Through acts of dramatic transformation by gods, goddesses, and mortals, this book's central notion is that a person's soul remains unchanged through metamorphosis. The stories within Metamorphoses are arranged in a chronology that starts with the creation of the world and ends with the death and deification of Julius Caesar, which happened a year before Ovid was born. The poem is written in dactylic hexameter verse. For more on verse, listen to our episode on Shakespeare's prose and verse. As it traces its way through its chronology, Ovid retells key events in Greco-Roman mythology. Metamorphoses does not follow one character or storyline from beginning to end, so neighboring stories in the collection sometimes have little to no connection to each other, other than being a story of transformation and the next in the chronology. Despite Ovid's unbroken chronology and Ovid's sometimes seemingly arbitrary way of jumping from one story to another, scholar Brooks Otis identified four divisions within the overall narrative. According to Otis, the books can be grouped like so. Books 1 and 2 are the Divine Comedy. Books 3 through 6, line 400, are the Avenging Gods. Books 6, line 401 through 11, are the Pathos of Love. And books 12 through 15 are Rome and the Deified Ruler. Now, trying to summarize all of the stories contained within the 15 books would probably turn this mini-episode into a full-length episode. So instead, we have chosen to highlight stories that may be familiar to listeners who are familiar with Shakespeare or Greco-Roman mythology. With that said, here are some of the stories contained in Ovid's Metamorphoses, according to, mostly, Sparknotes. In Book 1, Ovid writes of the creation of the world for man to rule. Mankind goes through four ages. One, the age of gold, a time of goodness. Two, the age of silver, a time of hard work. Three, the age of bronze, a time of the first wars. And lastly, the age of iron, a time of bloodshed. In the Iron Age, the gods witness human impiety, so Zeus floods the humans. Deucalion and Pyrrha must repopulate the world. This book also includes the myths of Daphne's transformation into a laurel and Io's transformation into a heifer. In Book 2, the son of Helios, Phaeton, asks his father to prove that he is, indeed, his father. To prove it, Phaeton rides Helios' chariot across the sky. Phaeton loses control of his father's chariot and damages the earth. Jupiter stops and kills Phaeton by hurling a thunderbolt. This book also includes the myths of Callisto's transformation into a bear, Kiknos's transformation into a swan, and the rape of Europa. In Book 3, Europa's father exiles the mythic hero Cadmus because he cannot find Europa. While exiled, Cadmus established Thebes. However, Cadmus's household is now plagued. His grandson, Actaeon, is transformed into a deer after seeing Diana bathing in a grove. Actaeon's own hunting dogs then kill him. Semele, Cadmus's daughter, becomes pregnant with Jupiter's child. A jealous Juno convinces Semele to ask Jupiter to make love with her as a god, a no-no in Greek myth. Jupiter does, so Semele dies. Jupiter brings back their son, Bacchus, in his thigh. This book also includes the myths of Tiresias and Narcissus and Echo. In Book 4, Minyas's three daughters weave and tell stories. The first tells the tale of a forbidden love between Pyramus and Thisbe. The second tells a tale of Mars and Venus's affair, in which the mortal Lukuthue is punished by being buried alive and then transformed into frankincense. The third tells the tale of Salamacy's desires for Hermaphroditus, in which the two become one. The book also includes the myths of Perseus saving Andromeda by using Medusa's head to petrify the sea monster. 
In Book 5, Perseus's marriage to Andromeda is contested by Andromeda's former fiancé, Phineas, and his army of over a thousand men. Perseus retaliates by turning the men into stone with Medusa's head. This book also contains the myths of Minerva meeting the Muses and hearing of Calliope's song about Dis, or Pluto, raping and abducting Prosperina, and the myth of Lyncus being turned into a lynx. In Book 6, Minerva and Arachne, her rival in the art of weaving, compete in a contest and, unlike Minerva's glorification of the gods, Arachne's tapestry creates a portrait of the gods raping and deceiving humans. Minerva physically assaults Arachne, so Arachne hangs herself. Then, Minerva transforms Arachne into a spider. This book also includes the myths of Niobe mocking god worship and losing her children, and Philomela's rape and mutilation by her sister, Procne's husband, Tereus. As revenge, Procne kills her son and serves him as a meal to Tereus. Procne and Philomela escape by transforming into birds. Tereus also becomes a bird. In Book 7, Jason demands the Golden Fleece from King Aetes, but is told he has to complete certain feats. Jason promises to marry the love-struck Medea in exchange for her help against her father. Medea agrees and uses her magic to help Jason get the Golden Fleece. This book also includes the myths of Minos seeking military aid against Athens and Cephalus testing his wife Procris's fidelity. In Book 8, Minos attacks the city of Alcathaus and, during the siege, Scylla, the daughter of their ruler Nisus, falls in love with Minos. Scylla betrays her own father, which horrifies Minos, and he and his army leave. Scylla follows and, like her father, is transformed into a bird. This book also includes the myths of the Minotaur's labyrinth and Daedalus and Icarus's attempts to fly. This book also includes other various metamorphoses stories. Book 9 centers around Hercules and his wife, Deanira. First, Achilles tells how he fought with Hercules over Deanira's hand in marriage, but was unsuccessful. Then, Hercules saves Deanira from an attempted rape by Nessus, a centaur, by shooting Nessus with an arrow. As he dies, Nessus gives Deanira a poisonous cloak, but tells her it has a love charm. Sometime later, fearing that Hercules no longer loves her, Deanira gives him the cloak, which he puts on and dies a long and painful death. Jupiter and the gods turn Hercules into a god. This book also includes the story of Hercules' birth, as well as two stories that examine love from a social and heteronormative point of view. In Book 10, Eurydice dies and her husband Orpheus travels to the underworld to ask Proserpina and Pluto to return Eurydice. Orpheus sings a song that makes Proserpina and Pluto grant his request with the condition that Orpheus does not look back at Eurydice as they leave the underworld. Orpheus begins to climb out of the underworld, but, worried that Eurydice is actually following him, he looks back and loses her for good. This book also includes the myth of Cupid accidentally pricking Venus, his mother, with one of his arrows, which causes her to fall in love with Adonis, preferring him over heaven. She tells Adonis a story, after which he goes hunting and dies after being gouged by a boar. Venus mourns Adonis. This book also contains the myths of Ganymede, who is taken to heaven by Jupiter, and Pygmalion, a sculptor who falls in love with the statue he creates. In Book 11, Orpheus is killed by Thracian women and his shade joins Eurydice in the underworld. Bacchus punishes the Thracian women by turning them into trees. Bacchus gives King Midas the gift of golden touch. Finally, King Midas realizes the gift is a curse and asks Bacchus to take it away. This book also includes stories of suffering and transformation. The founder of Troy tricks Neptune and Apollo into building the Wall of Troy without properly paying them, and the gods punish Troy with a flood. Book 12 tells the story of the Trojan War and the battle between Achilles and Cycnus. Then, Neptune and Apollo plan to kill Achilles. Apollo appears on the battlefield under the cover of a cloud and tells Paris to shoot at Achilles. Paris does, and Achilles is killed. This book also tells a tale of a brawl with centaurs at a wedding celebration. In Book 13, 
Ajax and Ulysses argue over who deserves the arms of Achilles in front of the chiefs of the Greek army. The army chiefs award Ulysses the arms, and Ajax commits suicide. Troy falls, and misfortunes befall its citizens. Aeneas, the son of Venus, and his father and son set off to establish a new land. This book also features many tales of misfortune and woe. In Book 14, Glaucus asks Circe to help him win Scylla's love, but Circe refuses because she is in love with Glaucus. Circe transforms Scylla into a monster, but before Scylla can destroy Aeneas's fleet, she is turned into a crag. Aeneas goes to Dido's kingdom, then to Sicily, before arriving on the shores of Latium, where he is attacked and eventually dies. Aeneas is turned into a god because of his valiant fighting, and his son rules over the Latin kingdom. This book also tells the tale of Circe and Ulysses. There is a war between the Romans and the Sabines, after which Romulus establishes peace and is turned into a god. Last but not least, Book 15 follows Numa, who leaves his hometown to learn about the universe and becomes a student of Pythagoras. Pythagoras encourages vegetarianism. When Numa dies, his wife, Egeria, mourns and is comforted by Hippolytus, the son of Theseus. Hippolytus tells her stories to comfort her, but Egeria cries so much she is turned into a spring of water. After these stories, a plague breaks out in Rome that causes the Romans to bring Apollo's son to Rome to cease the plague. Then, Ovid tells of the murder and deification of Caesar, and of the rise and the future success of Augustus. A 1717 translation of the epilogue reads, quote, The work is finished, which nor dreads the rage of tempests, fire, or war, or wasting age. Come, soon or late, death's undetermined day. This mortal being only can decay. My nobler part, my fame, shall reach the skies, and to late times with blooming honors rise. Whate'er the unbounded Roman power obeys, all climes and nations shall record my praise. If tis allowed to poets to divine, one half of round eternity is mine. Unquote. Ovid's stories were a staple of Renaissance Europe, so it only seems natural that Ovid eventually emerged on England shores to influence the artists of Shakespeare's England. And Ovid's popularity is quite interesting because, as Dr. Tosh does point out, these inherited stories were a challenge to the gender conformity and sexual chastity of the early modern church. Many stories include lewd themes and plots, including the abduction and assault of mortals by the gods that go unpunished or punish the women. And we are sorry to Europa, Daphne, and Io to name a few of those victims. But early modern England had a champion for Ovid in translator Arthur Golding, best remembered for his 1567 translation of Metamorphoses. Golding was a friend of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and Sir William Cecil, the Lord Burghley, two of Queen Elizabeth I's favorites. While visiting Cecil House, he translated four books of Metamorphoses, publishing them in 1565 before finishing the complete 15 in 1567. While it is difficult to determine with precision how influential Golding's translation was, we do know that over the next 45 years, Metamorphoses was reprinted for a total of seven editions, so it must have sold pretty well. Furthermore, its literary influence can be seen in the writings of John Lilly, Thomas Nash, Thomas Haywood, and Robert Greene. In 1602, an anonymous play entitled Narcissus was performed at St. John's College, Oxford, on Twelfth Night, which declares in its prologue, quote, The play we play is Ovid's own Narcissus, unquote. When compared to Golding's translation, it is clear that the writer of Narcissus was informed by Golding. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. How was Shakespeare inspired by Ovid, and where can we see examples of this inspiration in Shakespeare's works? Well, Shakespeare's most Ovidian works are his narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece. But Ovid's influence can be found throughout Shakespeare's canon. Echoes of Ovid's linguistic style, as well as the linguistic style of the Golding translation, can be found in how Shakespeare writes his rhetorical passages. 
One striking linguistic echo is the speech in The Tempest where Prospero renounces his magic. His call to, quote, ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, unquote, echoes the words of Medea the Witch in Metamorphoses Book 7, quote, ye airs and winds, ye elves of hills, of brooks, of woods alone, of standing lakes, unquote. Prospero and Medea go on to make parallel claims about their magical powers, that they can command wind and trees and have the power to wake the dead. Ovid also serves as the foundation for many of Shakespeare's plots. Romeo and Juliet take some inspiration from Ovid's Pyramus and Thisbe, a title which is also prominent in A Midsummer Night's Dream. In fact, the Pyramus and Thisbe performed by the Mechanicals is a parody of Ovid's story of forbidden love in Book 4 of Metamorphoses. Quince's very literal interpretation of Ovid's story turns the play into the opposite of an Ovidian story. There is no magic or supernatural, no nature, no transformation. Shakespeare's use of Ovid as plot inspiration and useful classical reference is incredibly evident in Titus Andronicus. In Titus, Ovid's story of Philomela is explicitly and repeatedly referenced throughout the play as it simultaneously serves as the source material for the plot. Shakespeare's characters actively engage with their own understandings of the Philomela story and work to revise and improve upon the original story. In a key moment of revelation, a copy of Metamorphoses is physically present on stage, allowing Lavinia to use the classical story to convey what happened to her. Ovid's stories have also influenced, and continue to influence, poets and writers beyond Shakespeare. His story Pygmalion from Book 10 tells the story of a sculptor who falls in love with a statue he creates. This story was the basis for George Bernard Shaw's 1913 play of the same name, which then became the 1956 musical My Fair Lady. In 2013, Madeline Miller's short story Galatea retold the myth from the point of view of the statue. Orpheus and Eurydice, also from Book 10, informs the plot of Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge, and was also adapted into the musical Hades Town in 2016. If you are interested in reading Ovid's Metamorphoses, but are nervous about the sexual violence, we recommend reading female translator Stephanie McCarter's edition. According to the hardcover, it, quote, addresses accuracy in translation and its representation of women, gender dynamics of power, and sexual violence in Ovid's classic, unquote. And that's Ovid's Metamorphoses and Shakespeare. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare Any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Cymbeline, Act 3, Scene 4, said by Inigen. Hath Britain all the sun that shines?